So tonight we have the next public talk in this initiative Global Minds for Ukraine, which brings uh, the world uh, most uh, famous intellectuals, right, to speak to Ukrainian students and the public. Uh, I am Maxima Brizan. I'm associate professor at Kiev School of Economics and also secretary at researcher at WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. And uh, it's a great honor and a privilege for us to welcome here uh, Dr. Marilyn Warren, uh, who was a former member of the Parliament of New Zealand. And then as a scholar, she formalized uh, the ideas of feminist economics in her book, which was published in 1988. Uh, and uh, this famous book uh, title is If Women Counted, A New Feminist Economics. So let us give a warm welcome to Professor Marilyn Warren here. And uh, I think uh, we have some uh, people who participate uh, in this uh, as, as, uh, as uh, you know, um, right now. And uh, given blackouts, we'll also have a recording on YouTube, right? So those who cannot uh, join the meetings will be able to watch it later on YouTube. And I think the first question uh, which I have is, uh, you know, like um, in Ukraine, I think many people have been surprised by this support uh, that uh, we received from, from the rest of the world. Uh, like if you think about New Zealand, it's very far away. It's 12 hours uh, difference with Ukraine. And still we have the support from the government of New Zealand, from ordinary people of New Zealand. So uh, why do you think Ukraine uh, got this support from the rest of the world in this uh, situation of this crazy Russian aggression? So why, why do you think we, we are supported so much? Yeah. Maxime, I think there's many reasons. There's respect for territorial integrity. Um, there's the opposition to war. There's the moral and ethical belief in the cause of the Ukrainian people. Mm -hmm. There's just the humanitarian wish mm -hmm. to do something uh, in, in such a, a criminal, really, mm -hmm. situation. And so even though we are so far away, mm -hmm. you know, we send, as we would say in our language, our aroha, our mm -hmm. love and and support and certainly there is no opposition at all in this country to the assistance to the ukraine yeah yeah i think it's it's, it's very important to, to get the support right and uh, i remember uh, like there was this example when uh, a tv host in japan she started crying when putin gave a word uh, you know to these criminals who killed people in bucha like he, he awarded this battalion or whatever so i think it's very important and um, so to continue, uh, so like you written this great, you, you, you wrote this great book, you published this great book, If Women Counted, you started talking about this issue of, you know, um, gen of justice, of economic justice, right? I wouldn't put it just like as a gender uh, equality, but 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 more general. Uh, and uh, I wonder, and it's been more than 30 years, right? It's, 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 it's quite, it's quite sort of some time, some time past. But do you observe the change in narrative upon policymakers, maybe in New Zealand or internationally, or if you take, you know, maybe some World Bank, IMF or uh, United Nations, uh, do they accept uh, these views more openly now? Uh, do, are there any real changes in, in this kind of, uh, in, in accounting for this, for, for this work, which is sort of unpaid? What, what do you think? Um, well, well, there have been changes in the rhetoric. Maxime, and there have definitely been changes in the rules of what's called the United Nations System of National Accounts, and this in particular around something called the boundary of production. So, you know, basically the boundary of production since 1953 um, excluded all what they think of as household consumptive activities. Uh, and right in the beginning in 1953, they left out a lot of subsistence activities as well. So there have been changes to the boundary. In 68, 1968, it was mostly to admit unpaid work traditionally undertaken by men. So it would be things like carpentry, um, shoemaking. You know, it's a strange list, but there it was. Uh, and in uh, 1993, 
they tried to clarify that things like the carriage of water, uh, the collection of fuel, etc., and certainly all subsistence agricultural activities where production may be for barter or for sale as well as consumed in the home, mm -hmm. then that was supposed to change the boundary of production. But it simply doesn't. So it changed it in the rules, but in the collection of data mm -hmm. for national accounting by statistics departments, no, they've never really moved. They don't really count it. Then there's the, um, I think, the, the other huge issue is the vast amount of illegal activity, mm -hmm. um, whether it's trade in, you know, munitions or people or endangered mm -hmm. species or whatever, provided there's cash exchanged, mm -hmm. that's all part of, mm -hmm. you know, the GDP. So, uh, and as well, I think probably the one of the major ways in which it's, addressed at the moment but not mm -hmm. <laughs> is in terms of the climate change mm -hmm, arguments mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the the need to increase GDP figures mm -hmm. is one of the fundamental reasons that the planet is in crisis. Mm -hmm. The mining, the deforesting, the exploitation, the depletion uh, has nearly all been carbon generating. And so while people are recognising a climate crisis and, you know, setting targets and stuff like that, nothing's changed in the mm -hmm. GDP. So now with the war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. as there's a spike in oil and gas, you know, as coal is needed again, oh, to hell with the climate, right? Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. get this stuff out of the ground. Mm -hmm. So... No, I don't. I mean, I've been talking about it all my life. I, I don't know if we've made a hell of a lot of progress. Um, some countries under the OECD are trying for what they call a well-being presentation mm -hmm. of their budget. Mm -hmm. And New Zealand is doing that. Um, and it's an alternative exercise to the GDP. Mm -hmm. So we don't try and muck with the boundaries of the GDP or pretend even mm -hmm. that foundationally it's a system that you'd want to add to. It's like, okay, we have to put that over there in that corner and then try and start to generate well-being data, which is way beyond the purely macro or microeconomic. Mm -hmm. And, and it's actually interesting. Like I'm, 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 I'm listening to you, to your answer. And what's interesting, like even rich countries, right? There is this idea of satellite accounts, right? You try to account for childbearing or unpaid work. But even rich countries like Australia, they you know collected. Uh, some countries, most countries don't do it. And a few countries that do it, they do it like once per decade, right? They they don't really. But they have they have to do it every year, right? We know that in Australia. Uh, Childbearing, it's a 20% of GDP if it was counted properly, right? Other unpaid activities, it's the second leading course. So is there any way we can make it regular, this data collection? Is there any way we convince politicians and policymakers and ministries of statistics and ministries of the economy? I, I know it's like a naive question, right? But, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you, you've seen this uh, British sitcom, Yes Minister, Yes Prime Minister, how the how it works like in reality like there's civil service there is a political process but uh, are there any recipes which you can give to ukrainian uh, mps maybe or maybe uh, people who work in the ministries uh, because apparently there is a lot of um, there are a lot of good people who want to make change right but how can how can they make this change well i think i i think the one of the fundamental pieces of data needs to be time use surveys um, and fun fundamentally, everybody has the same amount to exchange. We all start in the same place. It's not like counting wealth or market uh, transactions. Um, and also, if you look at how people use their time, um, you will very quickly discover who is time poor. That means they're so busy, they don't have time available to look after themselves properly, um, uh, 
uh, and we, we generally those who are time poor are already in uh, a, a lower um, class, to use the old term, mm -hmm. uh, but especially in terms of assets and income. Mm -hmm. So if you're poor in terms of assets and income and you're a mum with three kids under five and no car, right, time is a very, very different indicator of um, your well-being okay, than any kind of market exchange or income level. Um, and, and as a politician, time use is very important because it can show you targets. It can also show you huge numbers of other really useful things mm -hmm. like retail hours or library mm -hmm. opening hours or where the country will be in terms of emergencies, um, you know. So uh, there have been... As, as you know from the work you did with WHO, I think there have been time use surveys in over 80 mm -hmm. um, countries and, and many around the world. And at one stage, uh, a lot of them mm -hmm. in Africa. And that was because of one woman statistician with mm -hmm. a drive, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and others seeing what she was doing and moving mm -hmm. into that space. So that for me is major um also i think one of the really important things um maxime mm -hmm. is being a politician is very different from being in a finance ministry mm -hmm. okay in a finance ministry you're just driven by data mm -hmm. and as a politician you actually have to weigh up a number of considerations every time you make a decision and that is not based only on one data set, is GDP up or down, right? Um, it might be based on the natural description of environmental characteristics, not what they're worth in the market, mm -hmm. but how there's a change in them over time, mm -hmm. um, whether that's temperatures, whether that's river levels, whatever it is, and around the planet, that's very fast moving. Mm -hmm. And, and to think that you can make sense of any of that by asking yourself the question, oh, if this was marketed tomorrow, what would it be worth, is a complete mm -hmm. nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in New Zealand as well, we have very special indigenous Maori values. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, these are the people who have lived in Aotearoa, New Zealand, for... Mm -hmm. Uh, 900 years, they know this place. Um, they cared very much for this place. Uh, and so we have, we also here can have this lovely complementary mm -hmm. um, system, which means that you stop and you consider other um, values. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine heads her. Hapu, that means uh, a tribal um, board. Mm -hmm. And they were meeting together for two days to write their next strategic plan mm -hmm. for 100 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not a strategic plan for five or ten. Right. A strategic plan for 100 years for right. their land. Right. 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 So it's a, you know, you, it does, makes you stop. It's really good for all of us in here mm -hmm. uh, and and consider, you know, does the river have a spirit? Um, people will find it really probably strange that here we have Te Awa Whanganui, a whole river. We have Te Maunga, Taranaki, this amazing mountain. Mm -hmm. We have Te, te Uruwera. And they all have now the in law, the characteristics of nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you damage them, it is the same as damaging a life mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. they are the life force, mm -hmm. right? And it's a wonderful way to protect mm -hmm. things, Maxim. Mm -hmm. It's great. So, so here we have, we're trying to get kind of at least four sets mm -hmm. of data and value operating because 
politicians have to make decisions across a range of variables. <laughs> and, and if we go back to early COVID, um, what, ha what happened in the countries, some countries obviously didn't happen in a number, mm -hmm. was that at the emergency cabinet meetings, the treasurer was not in charge. Mm -hmm. The public mm -hmm. health officials were in charge, right? Every, mm -hmm. So much emergency services were in charge. Like it was this huge spread of, of who had to be at the table and mm -hmm. all the information that had to be there for decisions. Now, mm -hmm. that's a very good example of how a cabinet should work all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it, uh, I think, I think it's not just, um, um, politicians that have to be persuaded, though. It's the economists who just love sitting safe in their little system. Mm -hmm. you know? Right, exactly, and, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And it's always been powerful for them, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. To be an economist is to generally be able to obfuscate really important things from other members of the public and okay. to retain power by doing that. You know, it's a powerful position. It, no, it, they like that. <laughs> and it's the same it's the same about resource distribution i think this is just another thing mm -hmm. but look mostly it's men in power mm -hmm. and they're not crazy mm -hmm. and when you talk about adding mm -hmm. time use and environmental characteristics they can see that this is a huge transfer of resources away mm -hmm. from things that fundamentally make their lives better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so of course there's resistance all right, sure, sure, yeah, sure. No, of course. No, I think you know, like it's good that you mentioned the economists, right? Because uh, I, I know, like, there is some work which is uh, which was saying uh, just ten years ago that oh, don't worry about this uh, change in the climate. It, it, like, the, it will be like two percent loss of GDP by uh, <laughs> by the next century, right? And people get Nobel prizes for that, right? And people believe in that, right? Yes. And, oh, just, no, price, pr price will reflect it. Price will don't worry. Price will reflect it, right? And of course, it doesn't, right? So yeah, that, <laughs> and um, so, so the next question, like, so I mentioned that you are a member of um, WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All. And the question is, why did you decide to join the council, right? Well, what value do you see in your work uh, in, in, in this kind of uh, organization? Um, okay, so the first answer is uh, that it was a stunning collection, stellar collection of other economists, and they were all women. Mm -hmm. So I'm 70 years old now, but I've never been invited <laughs> to join <laughs> <laughs> a, a council of, of that sort of esteem right. <laughs> that was all women. It's like, right. oh, my God, there still are new experiences in life right. at this age. You know? <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> right. I hasten to add that I had hoped they were all feminists. Yeah. Uh, yes. Anyway, then I really, I really didn't feel or know what I might have to contribute. Um, but especially working with you, so I've been able to set off on these little side streams, um, the unpaid work one in particular, and now mm -hmm, the question mm -hmm. we're exploring on lactation. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so that's kind of been like that's asking new questions, trying to work around, working with you, seeing what WHO has. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's kind of fun. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the meetings mm -hmm. at 2 or 3 a.m. are not fun. And I pretty right. much just listen to the tape recordings now. Right, right. Okay, and to continue with, with unpaid work, right? So uh, what are the pathways from time poetry, right, which you can uh, observe from time use data, uh, like, like which is coming often from unpaid work, right, because people are overworked at home, especially women, right? Uh, yeah. So what is the pathway from that to bad health, right, or to lack of good health? So can you maybe outline a couple of main channels, how this prevents people from being healthy? Uh, yes. Um, so, uh, like, let's, uh, we'll paint a couple of pictures, I think. So if I'm a subsistence woman, mm -hmm. farmer in... Uh, 
Oh, let's take South Asia. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I immediately am going to have a number of issues. One is collection of water. Mm -hmm. One is um, the collection of fuel. Mm -hmm. I'm poss possibly um, uh, indentured because my husband has signed to work mm -hmm. uh, for cropping and mm -hmm. sometimes that means without my being asked, I'm indentured too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got kids to look after. I've got mm -hmm. an elderly parent. I've got to try and grow some food mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. um, as well. Uh, um yeah, like so, and and you know, cooking is going to mm -hmm. be every day takes hours, mm -hmm. and it means that my activities are also simultaneous all the time. I'm never doing only one thing at once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and and I'm going to eat last. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to have the poorest nutrition of everybody. I'm going to have worked the longest days. I'm going to have worked at the most tasks mm -hmm. and a lot of those simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And I'm exhausted, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what I really want mm -hmm. <laughs> that would make all the difference to me in my life is a new chula. Because mm -hmm. if I had a new stove, just mm -hmm. a little stove made out of clay, mm -hmm. I could save hours and hours a day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But unless somebody does a time use study, mm -hmm. nobody is ever going to see how you might relieve my work burden. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Or if we take a, a, a typical New Zealand kind of situation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, you're, um, you have some paid work, um, you have your um, fully dependent father living mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm, house. Mm -hmm, you have mm -hmm. a child who is 24 7 dependent. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it, you're, again, just you cannot get reimbursed for all the care that you do in your home. Mm -hmm, so you mm -hmm. cannot hire somebody to do that mm -hmm. work for you. Um, the, the, you're going to have to keep taking time off work when one or other of them needs to go to a specialist or a doctor or to mm -hmm, anything mm -hmm. like that because your life is not your own. Your life is to keep these two people flourishing as best you can. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to your transport costs will be high mm -hmm. because of you know looking after right, them, right. Um, and you're likely to be in a fairly menial job mm -hmm. while you're doing this, mm -hmm. uh, and. And as you can already see, the fact that somebody might give you annual leave does not mean you take a holiday and stop working. Right, right. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. So, right. so, you know, from a public policy point of view, in, in that context, the mm -hmm. interventions can easily be around mm -hmm. respite care, around mm -hmm. offering more care in the home. Um, around transportation subsidies or even mm -hmm. taxis for those people who are invalided, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. to be able to get to specialists, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you cannot see that unless mm -hmm. you have a time use survey. Mm -hmm, From mm -hmm. the census or even the disability census we have here now in New Zealand, mm -hmm. you might pick up that she's a caregiver for two, but that's all you're going to pick up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and... Uh Right. Yeah. But 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 if I think about the political process here, right? The percent yeah. of let's say if you take rich country, let's take New Zealand, right? Uh, probably the percent of women like that is small. So like it's it's not like majority vote, or or you think it will be still implemented? Uh, like if it's uh, if it's a small fraction of women who are affected by that. I mean, if, no, I, if well, you think I don't, about, yeah, I don't think it's all that small actually. When you look okay. at the um, extent of child poverty. Child poverty is nearly always occurring in a single-headed household uh -huh, headed uh -huh. by women. Right, right, right. right. And child poverty is a major issue right. in New Zealand. Okay. So you cannot run away from it. It's a major uh -huh. um, health for all issue. Okay. Poverty right, always right. is. Right, right, right. You know. Right. So, right. so no, and, you know, successive governments go on and on about, mm -hmm. you know, how shocking it is and what they're going to do to intervene. But this mm -hmm. is an intergenerational, you know, you've got to have a, mm -hmm. 
when governments set up something, then you've got to have others that come in who are um, also, you know, mm -hmm. going to continue those programs, mm -hmm. um, you know, for a generation at least mm -hmm. to try to mm -hmm. shift some of that um, work burden. And, you know, one, it, like, one, one of the things that's really important to say, Maxine, when you say, mm -hmm. oh, you know, mm -hmm. that's not so much anymore, is mm -hmm. think about the UK mm -hmm. statistician, chief statistician. Mm -hmm. It's now maybe five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. And he'd finished the census and he was doing his annual report to Parliament. And he mm -hmm. said, the single largest sector of the mm -hmm. UK economy is unpaid work. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He said it is more than the equivalent of all retailing and all manufacturing on an annual basis. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. when the newspaper said to him, oh, why are you saying this? Mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. said, I don't think you can make policy without mm -hmm. looking at the single largest sector in the economy. Mm -hmm, right, so right. even though you say, oh, well, in New Zealand, you know, there's not much of this or that. Actually, mm -hmm. when you add everybody's together, it's still mm -hmm. vast, and mm -hmm. you can't make policy if mm -hmm. you don't have a picture of mm -hmm. your country's single largest sector. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I remember this uh, again. One of the joke from uh, yes, minister was that from the point of view of Ministry fi of Finance, it's good if people smoke, right? Because they don't survive until pension, right? And they don't get pension. So uh, it makes sense for them not to collect this data because, you know, then they don't have any incentive to, to resolve the problem, right? They say, okay, just, it's not it's not there, it doesn't exist. Uh, second, like the next question I have is, it's about uh, your work on uh, breast milk, right? So we know that um, WHO recommendation, it's at least uh, six months, uh, should be exclusive breast milk, uh, for infants, right, for newborns, uh, again, if, if, if people don't have any sort of allergies or whatever. Uh, and at the same time, we know that formula milk industry is a huge, a huge sector, like $50 billion, $70 billion worldwide. And it's a great contributor to climate change, right, because of the greenhouse effects of, of the cows. So are there any recent policy debates or policy recommendations? How can we you know, improve uh, breast uh, feeding rates, uh, right? And how we can also try to reduce this greenhouse uh, effects uh, of of, uh, of this milk industry. Yes. So I think in in my TED talk, I say that in the national accounting framework for New Zealand, the milk of buffalo, goats, cows, and sheep is counted, but not the best food of all, mm -hmm. which is breast milk. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit on this, I think, um, Maxime, mm -hmm. because um, when I wrote If Women Counted, you'll see that I was I really focused in around the environment and around this vast range of unpaid work. I was mm -hmm. also looking at reproduction, so the reproduction of human life uh, and lactation. Um, and... I, my, my economics comes out of development economics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not classical economics. Right, right, right. right, right. And, and political economy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right, which is what's the ideology going on here? What's the power dynamic going on mm -hmm, here? Mm -hmm. Who does this best suit? You know, mm -hmm. all of those right, kinds right, of right, yeah, yeah, words. Yeah. And, and and trying to get in and uh, deconstruct language because mm -hmm. e economists are great colonizers. You know, they pick up a word like value, which is a perfectly beautiful word um, to be strong or worthy, it means, and then they corrupt mm -hmm. its use for in English, certainly, anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so... One of, the, one of the interesting things over the last 30 or 40 years has been the way in which feminist economics has not done nothing, really, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about breastfeeding. And I think one of the issues is 40 or 50 years ago, a lot of the women working in economics were just left, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed mm -hmm. to feminist, uh, and saw people talking about human reproduction and lactation as kind of natalists, mm 
Mm -hmm. who were going to get in the way of important advances for women so that they could work just as hard as men in the paid workforce and get mm -hmm. to do two full-time jobs, mm -hmm. right? One mm -hmm. paid and one unpaid. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. So, so if you look at feminist literature, you won't find much on this. However, if you look at development literature uh -huh. and at health literature, certainly. And, and I don't know if your students will be interested, but uh -huh. I think there's a great little tool on the web called the mother's milk tool right right, so right, you right. Can look up the mother's milk tool uh -huh. and choose any country and go to it and it will tell you uh the for example the proportion of babies fed by breast milk mm -hmm. solely in the first six months then out to mm -hmm. 12 mm -hmm. etc mm -hmm. and and it also has a calculator Mm -hmm. of what is this production worth? And when Julie Smith and others who were working on this first did it, they were calculating it as formula. I said, God, you can't do that. You can't mm -hmm. calculate. First of all, it's much better. It's mm -hmm. much mm -hmm. more healthy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it doesn't have any of the environmental and climate change sure, effects. Sure, sure. You're never going to have to transport it or worry about right. the value chain or God knows, you know. Right, right, right. right. So I said, you can buy it, right? right? You can buy mm -hmm. fresh burst milk on eBay. Well, mm -hmm. that's how economics works. There's a market mm -hmm. price for the mm -hmm. real thing. So mm -hmm. now they use the breast milk price on eBay mm -hmm. for the calculator all the mm -hmm. time, which, of course, is much fairer. Mm -hmm. But what it does mean is that if you push on a country like Kiribati, mm -hmm. the value of breast milk production is the same as its GDP. Right. right. Anyway, yeah. so so it's all been ignored for years. So one of the things you and I are going to try and explore with WHO mm -hmm. is why nation states can't climb, can't claim carbon credits for breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So right. you'd put yes, in a yes. particular particular mm -hmm. ratio, it would be like if more than 95% of children were fed for the first six months and 90% for the second six, because it's much easier for us all to calculate if it's just on a 12-month basis, and you exclude everybody else. And what and what that does immediately is, as you can imagine, boom, going flat out to the top immediately, go, you know, Nepal, the mm -hmm. Maldives, the whole mm -hmm. of the South Pacific, loads of the Caribbean, you know, mm -hmm. many, many, oh, huge across the African continent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bangladesh, places mm -hmm. like this, right? Mm -hmm. And and when you also read, you see, oh, my goodness, these countries are right in the line of fire mm -hmm. for um, sea level rises, all the emission things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think one of the real pluses um, about looking at this would mean that the, <laughs> when you buy the credits, the World Bank and the, the IFIs mm -hmm. can't get in the way with mm -hmm. their conditionalities, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's not like saying, oh, okay, here's this investment money, but now we need you to cut social services and we need mm -hmm. you to mm -hmm. cut hospital building and we need you to... You, you'd be completely free, completely mm -hmm. free of all of that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and just be able to you know put the credits up for for sale and purchase, mm -hmm. and you'd hope that our that um, uh, countries were mm, ethical enough to make sure that they you know weren't buying Marley's credits three times or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you'd, you'd need some kind of operation moving there. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it is so obvious. It right. is so obvious. It will be really interesting, Maxime, if we push mm -hmm. and push and make no traction. Sure, sure. But yeah, so but much about what's wrong with economics is so obvious, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because because we know that uh, you know rich countries are responsible for the climate change, right? But the poor countries. Uh, Pay the costs, right? So if you have this uh, breastfeeding uh, carbon credit, at least rich countries will pay to the poor countries, right? And they can undo, right, some of this uh, damage, as you mentioned, uh, raise, um, rising sea levels and, and all other issues related to climate change. So we have a, a few students who want to ask questions, but before we let them ask questions, I have the last question, uh, which I ask of all uh, female uh, presenters. 
And uh, so you mentioned that WHO Council um, has only uh, female economists, uh, right? And of course, uh, we should mention uh, there are many, all of them are brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, thinkers. Of course, I should mention the head of the Council, Mariana Mazzucato, uh, Kate Ravors, uh, who developed this donut economics kind of alternative to GDP. Of course, yourself and many, many others uh, in this council. And, you know, but uh, so it's clear that uh, female uh, economists are, they ask the right questions. They ask uh, often inconvenient questions, right? Uh, but how can we encourage girls to study economics? I have a daughter, right? I want her to become an economist, but she wants to become uh, some kind of TikToker or something. She's like seven years old only. But how can I convince her to become an economist, right? Because, you know, women matter in economics, obviously. W what would be your recommendation? Um, I would point out to her all the work that needs to be done to see and value all that women do mm -hmm. and that we need women working on that and good men like you, Maxine. Okay, okay, okay. Good, thank you. So we have questions from the audience. I think we can start with uh, Andriy Temchuk. Uh, so Andriy, uh, please. I uh, hope, I hope, well, yeah. Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my question concerns uh, GDP, but uh, in terms of imp uh, in terms of improvement of what we have, I mean GDP measure. So uh, I've often uh, heard uh, about how uh, how uh, the GDP growth in developed countries. Uh, has diminished, dis decelerated in recent years, but at the same time, people in Europe began working less hours, so they have more time to spend on leisure, on themselves, on their family, but it it is not accounted in GDP. So uh, would it be better to measure not GDP per capita or per worker, but GDP per hours worked instead, per total hours worked? By, by the labor force? Um, my immediate answer is no, because more than half of your population are invisible. So um, I think one of the best, like what I would call um, evolutionary moves for GDP, which could pick up some of what you're talking about, um, is an alternative framework um, it's been called lots of things, but more recently it's called the Genuine Progress Indicator. And the Genuine Progress Indicator uh, continues with each of the um, generic line entries, you know, transportation, agriculture, it's energy, etc., in the national accounts. Um, but it separates the GDP into um, productive activities that are good for the planet and for people and for productive activities that destroy people and the planet. So, for example, in, right at the moment, probably the biggest growth industry in the world is in munitions for the war, you know. Um, and war is not, war is dreadful. And why would we think that war contributes to growth? I mean, there are just some really significant ethical questions underlying this all the way. And then if they won't shift from GDP, how can we use the GDP framework to demonstrate destructive investment, investment in things that kill the planet and kill people? Um, and that, I think, is a, a kind of a framing that might take us some way along to recognising there is no way to make GDP better. It's a very, very sick instrument, and it's been sick since 1953 because the principles that it was built on were not about all people, we're certainly not about health for all, we're not about well-being, and we're not about protection of the environment. And there's, they can fiddle however they like. They will never change its underlying principles. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so, sorry, Andre. So we have two more questions from the audience, right? So I want uh, to give the opportunity to everybody to, 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 to ask questions. So we have a question from okay. Vitaly uh, uh, Kornienko. Uh, I'll ask one of them. He asks uh, a few, but I want to ask just one. So, uh, so the question is about environmental problems related to GDP. We briefly touched on that, but uh, Vitaly asks if uh, what is the balance between GDP growth and environmental externalities nowadays uh, and uh, in the future. He, he put bright future. I would think it's a bright future, but what's what's the link here? Yeah, well, of course, externalities pretty much still aren't included in your central GDP. Maxim spoke a little while ago about satellite accounts, right? So there's some attempt to capture environment in satellite accounting, but truly it's ludicrous. Like, really, what I say to my students is, what am I bid for a giant panda? You know, <laughs> like... You ought to pick some more endangered species and try to attribute a market price. This is completely ridiculous. Right? <laughs> the idea that, you know, we will carry on the malevolent approach of the GDP by saying that the environment is only valuable in terms of the market exchange. We attribute it to it if we were to destroy it mm -hmm. is a really sick way of thinking, truly. Really, it's like how much primeval forest is still here? Mm -hmm. How much have we destroyed? Right? How what has been the ocean level rise? What has been the change in temperature in the ocean level? How many places can people simply not breathe healthily anymore? You know, use things like you know the WHO has loads of guidelines on, you know, suspended particles in the air and everything. We don't need economics for that. Mm -hmm. We just don't need it. We just need common sense and the natural characteristics and not to be afraid of making decisions across a range of data. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we have a question from Petro Nachovkin. Um, and like before I ask the question, uh, I want to stress that uh, you know WHO and many other organizations they call for universal health coverage, right? It's one of the triple billion targets, right? And it's uh, again <laughs> generally agreed that it's efficient way to provide healthcare with universal health coverage. But uh, Petro asks a very reasonable question. So he asks about unhealthy food habits, and he asks that do societies need to improve food consumption habits first? Uh, before extending uh, public health care, which I guess stands for universal health care to all citizens, right? And uh, of course, uh, we should mention all these, you know, uh, unhealthy drinks, uh, which are advertised, junk food and all these all this issues. So how, how, yeah, how can we, how can we do that? Well, one of the ways is to ensure that people have sufficient income that they're not driven to the fast food as the cheapest food in town. Mm. You've got seven hungry kids, Listen, McDonald looks good compared with anything else. You're not going to have to use any fuel or electricity or any, you know, like you can see why. Mm -hmm. You can totally see why. Mm -hmm. um, and and I do think loads of that's around education and and uh, um, income. But look, the countries have introduced sugar taxes. Right, uh -huh. I think the UK has got a sugar tax, probably other places. Mm -hmm. New Zealand is huge on anti-smoking, just absolutely, mm -hmm. um, just really, really significant, constant, huge taxes, loads of advertising, you know, right down to things like drunk driving. You know, <laughs> here we have like this major patrols, is it really? So government, that's not obviously about food, but... But governments do intervene and governments do regulate and they can. Um, there tends to be in so-called Western democracies a bit of a standoff sort of if left, right makes any sense in a lot of places. So the left always more willing to regulate and the right always willing to say, oh, market forces let people decide for themselves, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I prefer intervention mm -hmm. myself. Um, and I would try to ensure that that for families and children in particular, that you had sufficient income to ha have variety in your mm -hmm. diet 
and uh, you know that, that you might be supported in other ways as well. Some of the food banks in New Zealand, for example, give cooking lessons. So mm -hmm. you know, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a whole a lot of those things are micro. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, much more micro, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and they're going to be far more successful uh, at a community level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think the last question, which is related, if I'm not mistaken, New Zealand is the first country to ban a cigarette uh, sell to people who are born after before after certain age, right? And they, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, right? And they want to eliminate, yeah, yeah from last smokers. week. That's from, right, from, from last week. Last, last week, they, yeah. they passed okay. the legislation. Yeah. Yeah, but, but but you know we are post economists, and we know that sometimes uh, uh, sometimes people can use smuggling, or they can you know grow tobacco. Do you think this will work? Like this policy overall, will it be effective in 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 eliminating smoking in let's say twenty years? Oh, the most important change has been the. I can't remember the numbers, Maxine, but mm -hmm. something like a cut from, let's say, a couple of thousand down to only 600 outlets for cigarettes will remain mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. whole country. Okay. okay. So, yeah, yeah. So, of course, there'll be a black market, but, it, you know, and, and there'll probably be raids on shops that sell cigarettes and Lord knows. We uh -huh. don't grow or manufacture anything here, so there'll probably mm. be container loads of cigarettes trying to be picked up by customs at the border. You know, all the usual, all that usual stuff will go ah, down. Is, but, is, is, uh, it pro is it prohibited to uh, to plant tobacco in uh, in New Zealand? Or why oh, we, used to, we used to grow a lot of tobacco. Ah, we used okay. to grow a lot of tobacco in the northern part of the South Island. Uh -huh. um, and God, it was even grown under government subsidy. So uh -huh. that's right back in the late 1960s, early 1970s. But uh, there are no manufacturers here anymore. Uh, and no, okay. I think serious. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So thank you so much uh, for finding time to talk to our students. Uh, and uh, if you could not join, uh, if, if some of our students could not join and, uh, because of blackout, it will be available on YouTube, uh, this video. So thank you for all your work, for your contribution, for your interesting insights. And uh, I hope that with these insights, we can raise uh, a better educated economists, right? And better educated voters who will not be afraid to ask right questions about economic justice. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maxim. And from New Zealand, Arohanui, Arohanui with our love. Thank you. Bye-bye.